Lakeland Public Television presents Currents. Good evening and welcome to Lakeland Currents. I'm Bethany Wesley. The baby boomers generation began turning 65 in 2011 and now, according to the U.S. Census, it is projected that more than 20% of the total U.S. population will be over the age of 65 by 2029. Yet it has also been reported that 55% of Americans die without a will or estate plan. And so tonight, we are going to be discussing wills and estate planning with Ron Carpenter, a Bemidji attorney who has been in private practice since 1973 with an emphasis on estate planning and real estate law. He is a member of the Minnesota State Bar Association in the Elder Law Section and Real Property Law Section, and is also a member of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. Welcome to the program. Thank you. It's nice to be here. As we start talking, let's talk pretty obviously. What exactly is an estate plan? Well, I like to have my clients think of estate planning in a, in a broad scope. So we talk about planning for death as well as planning for incapacity. Okay. So what happens if somebody does not take these steps? What happens when somebody either becomes incapacitated or dies without having gone through these planning steps? Well, without, uh, if, if a person becomes incapacitated and they haven't done any planning, uh, there's no one who can sign deeds for them. There's no one who can sign tax returns, uh, pay bills. And as a result of that, uh, the healthy spouse or a family member is going to have to go through a court proceeding to be appointed guardian or conservator. And that gets to be quite a costly, time-consuming process. Okay. In addition, the individual has to uh, file annual accountings with it too. So okay. something good to avoid in most situations. So do these plans only <clears throat> come into play upon death or incapacitation? Well, uh, we, for incapacity documents, uh, we talk about durable powers of attorney and health care directives. Okay. And those are valid the day you sign them. So, for example, with a durable power of attorney, uh, your agent, even though you're competent and capacitated, can act on your behalf. Normally, though, we think of the person acting only on death, or I mean on incapacity. Uh, with a health care directive, it's the same thing. The uh, person who created the health care directive still has control of making their own health care decisions, but they might be laid up in the hospital with a hip replacement, something like that, where they're competent, but they just can't get around to visit with their doctor and get test results. And okay. the agent they designate can, can do that for them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what are the benefits <clears throat> of having go through the steps? You go through the steps of estate planning, of all these, these different things you mm -hmm. can consider. How does that kind of become beneficial for the family upon somebody's death, for example? Well, on, on death, it's a, it's a real gift to the family because uh, the, the parent or the person who died provided some structure for the family. Who's going to be in charge uh, and uh, how assets are going to be distributed. And most often there are special considerations when putting together a plan. So uh, with a plan, for example, uh, you could provide special provisions for young people so uh, to hold their inheritance in a trust or there might be a disabled child or grandchild and if they were to inherit it might take them off social security benefits but they can do special planning to make sure that the gift for that person is preserved okay mm -hmm. so there really are different ways that you can tailor these for your unique needs oh absolutely indi yeah okay yeah there's no one size that fits all mm -hmm. In your opinion, when should people really start beginning to think about these things? About the time they uh, each reach the age of majority. Okay. <laughs> so it can be as young as, as a young adult. Uh, so for example, uh, if there's a college age student and, uh, and they have uh, uh, medical problems, well, their parents can't, can't access private medical information and that they can't be the advocate for that young student child of theirs. So it's, it's important for young people to even consider planning. If you go back uh, about two decades, there were two famous cases, uh, Karen Quinlan and Nancy Cruzan. <coughs> Excuse me, and their parents had to go to the uh, Supreme Court to be able to get permission to pull life support for their young daughters, college-age daughters. 
And of course, more recently, uh, we've heard of Terry Schiavo in Florida, and her husband uh, couldn't be her advocate and make decisions for her. He wanted to pull life support, but uh, Terry Schiavo's parents didn't. So as a result, there was a standoff, and that name became more famous than what the <laughs> family would want it to be. When there's cases like that that happen, you get those, you know, the more public profile, more people mm -hmm. talking about it. Do you see people starting to approach you more, starting to ask more questions? I, uh, I haven't, uh, but I can always raise these examples with them. Okay. And of course, the most recent one is uh, now with Prince and uh, he not having done planning. And uh, most people don't have those consequences <laughs> to that extent, but but there, nevertheless, those consequences are still devastating to the family. The, the survivors are left with a lot of unknowns, and uh, we all look through uh, our own filtered lenses at things, and good kids can get into on, honest disagreements if mom and dad haven't done the planning. Sure. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the type of person that should <clears throat> look into this type of planning or think about whether it, it would apply for them you know, mm -hmm. some people think it's only for those with kids, mm -hmm. only with those who are maybe perhaps a little bit more affluent, mm -hmm. not living paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. You know, is it appropriate for everybody or is it? I would say so. So for example, uh, we, we started with the young college age person, young adult, uh, who, who could use planning in a limited sense. Uh, just this week, I spoke with someone who is planning to get married and she and her husband-to-be uh, uh, don't have any assets to speak of, but her parents are very concerned about what happens if they die and she inherits everything and gets into marital problems. So even at that stage, we could do uh, premarital planning and do an anti-nuptial agreement for them. Okay, so that's something you have to do with the couple that's getting married as well as the, the parents? I keep the parents out okay. of it. Okay. So, so it's the, just the couple, the couple that's getting married. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So they're and and usually I represent only one of them. Okay. I encourage the other oh, to fiance get to get their own representation to have another pair of eyes look okay. at the at the plan. Mm -hmm. But I'm working for that person who's about to be married. Okay. And uh, if if they're concerned about inheriting uh, from their parents and having that exposed and lost through a premature death or divorce, uh, well then that planning is warranted. Okay. Yeah. Do you often have couples that come to see you only once they start to have children that they're really worried about the who's going to take care of the kids after? Well that's the next stage. Okay. And so now they're married yep. and they have a child and they're not going to have any more valuable asset than that young child. And I always tell them uh, it's important to have a plan in place if for no other reason than to designate guardians. And I always let them know that it, they don't have to be worried that no one is going to be interested in taking care of that young child of theirs. Well, their worry should be that they're going to have too many people wanting to do, take on that responsibility. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Do you ever have, <clears throat> you know, the people that are uncomfortable talking about death, they find it to be unsettling, they don't really want to talk about it because, mm -hmm. you know, they just have fears. Mm -hmm. Are there certain ways you can approach that to kind of help them think about it from a different perspective? Well, I think they've pretty well worked through it by the time they pick up with a phone and make an appointment. Okay. I always, I always, my observation is that's the most difficult thing to do. And uh, when they're motivated to pick up the phone and call, they've pretty much worked through it. Okay. But um, I think that it takes a few minutes of uh, conversation with them to get them warmed up to the concept and understand the importance of, of doing that planning. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when people are coming in for that first appointment, they've set up the appointment, they're ready to start tackling this, mm -hmm. what are the basic documents that they should kind of incorporate into that plan? Well, I, uh, I tell them that it's like, uh, to have a good solid plan, it's like having a four-legged stool. So in planning for death, uh, the one leg is typically a will, okay. sometimes it's a trust if people want to uh, avoid probate or have a trust for any other reason. So on death we have the one leg, okay. for incapacity we have two legs. Okay. It's important to have a durable power of attorney so that they 
appoint somebody who can handle business and financial matters if they become incapacitated or for other reasons. Uh, but those people cannot be your health care advocate. Oh, okay. So the third leg is to have a health care directive. Then they can appoint who, whoever they want to uh, be a health care advocate for them. The fourth leg is uh, work that they have to do after they've completed the, th the legal documents for the three legs. Okay. And I give them resource information to go home and do the rest of the planning. So there's a lot of information that families, parents should put together uh, in their planning, but it doesn't need to be included in the legal documents. But they have to be aware of what those subjects would be and how to handle it. Do the people that are specified or named in the planning documents, should they be consented or notified either prior to or after all the process had been going through? With, uh, it, it kind of depends upon what role they're to, they're to play. Okay. So for example, if it's a young couple who have a young child and they want to name one or more people as guardians for that young child, that's a, an awful big responsibility, 24-7 they're taking on. So uh, it's important for, for that couple to talk with the people who they're considering designating as guardians to make sure they're willing to take on that responsibility. And uh, for other people, it just depends. It depends upon the family dynamics. Uh, parents sometimes don't want to uh, visit with the kids about who they're gonna appoint as personal representative because they might change your minds. Sure. So you have to be careful. It's like uh, once those words are out of your mouth, you can't take them back. Take them back. And you might hurt their feelings later. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Once it's crafted, once you've kind of gone through these steps, you have a plan, how often do you recommend that it be reviewed? I, I recommend that they take a look at it once a year, okay. that they review it. If they have questions, uh, uh, a good time to do it is at tax time, I tell them get two miserable jobs out of the way at the same time. So take their documents off the shelf, look at them to see if any family situation has changed that would warrant a change in modifying their plan. Uh, the one thing they're not aware of is if there's been a change in the law. So I encourage them to give me a call okay. and I can let them know if there's a change in the law. The one thing I don't know if is whether there's been a change in the family circumstances. So if we touch base like that, uh, usually it's just a phone call and uh, probably a reasonable expectation for a shelf life might be five to ten years. Okay. Things change over the years and it's important to keep up with those changes. But it sounds like they basically check it over themselves, maybe give you they a do. call. They don't need to necessarily go through the whole process no, again no, once a year. It's just no, an update. And that's review. correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's talk about some of the different options mm -hmm. that they might have. You know, you, you mentioned a little bit about the wills versus the trust. What's mm -hmm. really the difference there as people are looking at those specifically? Well, a lot of times people come in and, and uh, they, they think of a trust as just a document and uh, uh, like one trust fits all situations. But there's numerous kinds of trusts. Okay. Anything from uh, estate tax planning to planning for an incapacitated child or grandchild to a trust to uh, consider protecting assets from nursing home okay. uh, costs, uh, trusts for minors, and uh, uh, also then people will come in and they'll, uh, I'll ask them what I can do for them and they say they want a trust. So I say, well, what do you want a trust for? Well, to avoid probate. You know, so, uh, so we go through that discussion and we weigh the, the pros and cons of a, a trust versus a will, probate versus non-probate. When people typically come in for these appointments, do you feel like they know kind of some of the different options or you can have to walk them through them or how much research should people do in advance? Well, when I get a call and uh, people are setting up an appointment for the first time, <clears throat> invariably they'll ask me, well, what should I, how should I prepare? And I say, bring in a list of your questions and uh, we'll go through them. Uh, I do have clients who come in though and they say, you know, we would have been in here five years ago, but it took us this long to figure out what we want. And after about 15 or 20 minutes of talking and I share different ideas and options, 
they've already forgotten about the plan that they came in with and they said oh these other options are better so I tell people not to overthink it and over prepare okay mm -hmm. okay um, we talked a little bit of how they can be tailored and you mm -hmm. talked specifically maybe about there are different ways that if you wanted to leave money to a child that they could be protected from a spouse would be a divorce mm -hmm. situation mm -hmm. um, are there ways to protect like a pet or a companion animal well uh, as of uh, uh, this last legislative session there is Minnesota was one of the last to adopt uh, laws that allow for the creation of uh, trust for pets but that legislation is now passed <clears throat> in the past though we did provide protections for pets but uh, it had to be in a pretty convoluted way Okay. So now we can be up front and we can create a trust for a, a pet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Had you heard from previous clients that this was something that people would ask? I'm just curious. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, they do. And uh, uh, so I remember one in, in particular, an elderly gentleman, and he wanted Lady protected. And uh, he, he knew he was not going to live beyond Lady's life. So we took care of Lady, and uh, there was a person who took uh, took good care of her, but uh, uh, it'll make it a lot easier now for people to do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, are there also ways to incorporate gifts, or you know, you want to really benefit a nonprofit or a project that's been really important to you? Oh, in your ab lifetime? absolutely. So uh, this is often not not thought about before they come in and see me, but we go through the process and we say now uh, we'll set aside special gifts you can create a separate sheet of paper that disposes of items of tangible personal property and uh, that separate list will be honored by the will or the trust another special gift uh, that i bring up is uh, that you might want to consider leaving a gift to the church or a nonprofit or an organization that means a lot to you and Suddenly they say, "Oh yeah, I never thought of that." You know, that'd be that'd be nice. Are so. there other specific requests people come in that you know they really want to protect certain things, or they really want to help? You know, uh, I think I think one area that is quite common is they might have three children, but uh, they uh, helped a child out either through educational loans or helping finance a bitter divorce or. Uh, just making a gift to them and they feel a little uncomfortable leaving all of their estate equally to all three children because this one child did get uh, something. already something during their lifetime so I say well let's put in a special gift for the other two children to offset that value so when you have a special circumstance like that do you recommend that families talk to their kids about that in advance or not not really uh, not it, it's up to them it's a pers personal judgment call often the other two children don't know about it and uh, but if they ever found out about it when mom and dad were gone they'd be upset if they didn't ha see an offset but they might very well appreciate knowing that mom and dad took care of it and they're much more understanding than that uh, there may be may have been reasons why they didn't tell the other two why the, er, that they were making this loan. Sure, sure. Yeah. Is estate planning expensive? I mean, for somebody to go through this process, like does it take one visit, two visits? Well, uh, first of all, most people, 85% of my clients have a pretty basic plan. They're all unique and uh, situations need to be addressed uh, for each of them. But uh, the, usually it takes at least two meetings. Okay. So we have an information gathering and sharing meeting. That's where I get more information from the clients. And with that information, I can narrow down the options for them to options that I'd want to know about if I were on the other side of the table. Okay. And uh, when I lay out those options uh, and answer all their questions, then they have a pretty good idea of what they want their plan to look like and what legal documents would be needed. And if they can provide me with the information I need to do the drafting, quite often we can complete it in a second meeting. Okay. People often say uh, when they walk out that uh, uh, if they knew it was going to be that quick and easy, they would have done it sooner. <laughs> yeah. As far as costs go, though, uh, I 
I let people know that I'll just bill for my time at the first meeting. But by the end of the meeting, if they know, have a pretty good idea of what they want as part of their plan, I can give them a very good idea as to what the rest of the cost would be. Okay. Cost can vary anywhere from, oh, generally, probably not less than $500. It'd be exceptional if it were a college student or something. Okay. But it could get to be several thousands of dollars when you're talking about somebody with 50 million. Depends so on the complexity of the estate. It, it really does, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, we've all seen advertisements or heard things about do-it-yourself wills mm -hmm. or things you can do online. Are mm -hmm. these also good options for people to look into? Well, uh, it, it's good for them to take a look at it. Um, I, uh, I don't go online to do my taxes every year, and I hire an accountant, a professional, and every time I write out the check, I tell myself, uh, this isn't costing me, it's, uh, it's pain. You know, I'm, I'm probably getting better deductions. I'm, I'm saving more money by having a professional do it than what I'm paying to that professional. And I think the same thing applies with estate planning. Okay. Mm -hmm. For those who are ready to really kind of start delving into this, I know you mm -hmm. said to kind of, you kind of have them come with questions, but mm -hmm. when they want to kind of just get an idea as to what their estate is, what kind of documents should they be looking into? What, what kind of information should they kind of take into well, consideration? Uh, under appropriate circumstances, if the clients want me to uh, provide them with a form, I, I'll mail out a questionnaire form. And that provides some structure for them then to give me the basic family background, type of assets that they own, and uh, that gets us off to a running start. Okay. So if they bring that in plus a list of their questions to make sure I cover all of them, uh, that's good preparation for the first meeting. Okay, mm -hmm. interesting. Can you tell us any like specific examples of, um, not people examples, but sure. some situations that people might want to keep in mind as they go into these? Any unique considerations that people should think maybe this is appropriate for me? Well, I, I think that it's, a, uh, as we've uh, visited earlier on in the segment, I think it, it, uh, it's obvious that people need planning uh, throughout their whole life spectrum. The, the type of planning just changes. Okay. And uh, so uh, any, anyone from a college age student to somebody in their 90s really needs a plan, but depending upon the age, uh, the plan can look different. How mm -hmm. did you get into this? Can you tell me a little bit about what it is about this field that really kind of w intrigued you? Well, I have an accounting background, uh, majored in accounting in undergraduate, so I'm a, a bean counter by, by trade. Uh, but uh, I, I love to state planning because uh, there's, there's parts of it where I can show how much I'm saving the client by doing this planning and they're not even aware of it. Or they want to gift some real estate while they're living but they don't realize the capital gains consequences to their children if they give it while they're living. It's better to actually transfer it on their death, for example. So I think uh, my back, my undergraduate background, drove me to the area that I'm in now. So mm -hmm. when you hear from your clients, you know, what is the benefit then for them? Is that they just know their families are taken care of, and the process after? Well, I think I think first of all, uh, the benefit to them, and I remind them of that, is they've done a good job for themselves. So they have their team in place. So even if they become incapacitated, there are people in place who can be their advocate and uh, take care of them the way they want to be taken care of. So it's a good benefit to the client themselves first. It's a wonderful gift for the family. It's a wonderful legacy to leave to the family. And it can save a considerable amount in time, expense, taxes by doing that planning. Often, when I finish doing the work for the kids, when mom and dad are gone, they're, they're overwhelmed and they say, what a wonderful gift mom and dad gave to us. You know, we better do the same thing. You know, but it wasn't on their radar screen until mm -hmm. that happened. Yeah. Do you ever have kids that contact you and say, you know, my parents aren't going down this path? Is there anything I can say to help them think about that? I've only had two this week. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have one from Iowa and one from Kentucky, and I'm going to be up seeing mom and dad, <laughs> you know, this summer. And uh, what can I do to get them in to see you? Yeah. <laughs> so, so I know there are a lot of kids who are concerned about their parents, and I always remind the parents, you know, your kids, they're concerned about whether you have a plan or not, but for the most part, the kids don't care what the plan is just so that there is one in place, so in case of an emergency, the kids won't be left with a lot of unanswered questions. And that comes down not only for the estate and the, the finances side of things, but for if and when mom or dad became incapacitated oh, or ill. absolutely, yes. absolutely. Because that has to be a big peace of mind for families. Well, it, it is, and uh, so for example, uh, with healthcare directives, the way I explain it to parents is, uh, this is a good gift for you because we're talking, part of the health care directive deals with end of life issues. Well, when do mom and dad want to be on life support? When would they ever want to consider having life support pulled? Well, I provide them with a good structure where the kids are instructed to talk with the medical expert, either mom or dad's physician or a physician of their choice, if they want a second opinion, and they're told to ask specific questions about mom or dad's condition, and depending upon the answers they get from the doctor, uh, mom and dad are telling them what to do. So it's nice for the parents because they know the kids, even under a very emotional, stressful situation, are gonna be asking the right questions, which will help mom and dad, and it's a wonderful gift to the child who's making those decisions so that they don't have to feel guilty about making tough decisions. Mom and Dad told me what to do. So, Great. Yeah. Well, thanks, Ron. I want to thank you for joining us today. I want to thank you for watching this current episode of Lakeland Currents, and please join us the next time. Mm -hmm.